Could I please ask those uh, in the gallery who are leaving the chamber to please do so quickly and quietly as we are about to move on to the next item of business. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item of business is a Members' Business Debate and Motion 8476 in the name of Ariane Burgess on Community-Led Housing Supporting a Sustainable Future. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Ariane Burgess. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A thousand affordable homes across the north and west of the Highlands will have more positive impact than a thousand houses adding to Inverness's urban sprawl or tacked onto Nairn. The first time I heard these words to that effect was from Elsa Rayburn of Community Land Scotland. And then I heard it again when talking to Ewan McLachlan from Ascent Development Trust about their ambitious community-led housing placemaking project in Loch Inver and more. Four or six new homes and villages would be transformational. Presiding officer, we have a commitment to build 11,000 new affordable rural homes by 2032. But all too often, our rural and island communities are low on the priority list. Let's not leave it until 2028 to turbocharge that effort. We have what we need in place to deliver the experience, the experience and the effort in all parts of rural and island Scotland. What's needed is input from government to streamline funding and delivery processes, and for public bodies to work with communities constructively, recognising they have different needs than private developers. The remote rural and island action plan is due imminently, and that plan should acknowledge that we have the know-how and local commitment, as well as a history of constructive partnership working. And the First Minister recognised with the commitment of £25 million to help councils buy affordable homes for key workers in rural communities that something must be done. And we have a range of measures in place or being developed to ensure that we steer housing away from the extraction model to one that will lay the foundations of our well-being economy and build community wealth. These measures include regulation of the short-term let's market and the consultation on council tax on second and empty homes. But we still need to get on with the building of new homes in places where there's nothing available. Young people and families are crucial to ensure the long-term future of our communities. But if they can't find affordable homes, they can't stay or settle. Communities in the Highlands and Islands have been leading the way and are ready to do more. The Rural and Island Housing Fund and the Scottish Land Fund are game changers. And with Greens in government, both of those funds have been secured with a commitment to increase them. Greens also secure the commitment to ensure community housing trusts are adequately funded so that they can support the delivery of our enhanced rural home building plans. These trusts are crucial for communities finding the confidence and building capacity to take on their home building and place making projects. The people at the heart of those organisations have been at this long enough to understand the hurdles communities have to overcome and can help with the design of the buildings, of the financial packages and the mix of tenures. They can also help put together constructive partnerships. In my region, the work that Communities Housing Trust, CHT, has undertaken is not just about housing. They support communities in placemaking and community wealth building by ensuring there's income generation elements beyond the housing. In Highland, along with housing, the Gareloch and Loch U Action Forum has developed 25 houses, a tourist information hub, shops and training facilities. The Staff and Trust in Sky, along with their new homes, workshop and business units, rent a purpose-built health centre to NHS, NHS Highland, bringing much needed medical access closer to people. And in Murray, the Tom and Tal and Glen Livet Development Trust have recently handed over 12 eco-homes to new residents and are developing the bunkhouse. Pipeline pro projects include Ascent Development Trust, Invergarry Development Trust, and the Woodland Trust. They have all housing, along with other amenities, in their plans, including Woodland Crofts, Path Networks, Enterprise, Work Units, and Education and Training Facilities. I know that with the affordable housing needs so desperate in my region that Highlands and Islands Enterprise would love to see CHT's capacity doubled. They've told me that we have so much employment potential in the region, but without housing, we won't be able to take full advantage of it. I've heard from communities who want to develop co-housing models where housing is designed to include 
shared common spaces, Hope Co-housing in Orkney, supported by the Orkney Island Council, are taking forward the UK's first rented tenure co-housing model for over 50s. They say we'll be looking out for each other, not looking after each other. And with the government's commitment to a preventative approach and the rapid closure of care homes in rural Scotland, this model must be urgently explored and invested in, not just for over 50s, but for intergenerational housing for families too. Let's come back to those 1,000 Highland homes. CHT and the communities they are working with propose rolling them out, just as if we were building a housing development in Inverness at scale. This can be done by setting up hubs, staging areas for materials and equipment at key locations where we aren't starting for scratch, from scratch every time. Materials would be purchased in bulk for a number of projects. This would reduce costs and carbon emissions from hauling long distances and create local employment, basically utilising the often overlooked North Highland circular economy and community wealth building potential. This model is not just for Highland. It could work in other parts of my region and in the south of Scotland. I focused on rural housing, but we also have beautiful but neglected town centres that are ripe for redevelopment into housing. In the south of Scotland, we have the transformational mid-steeple quarter in Dumfries, who are supported by the South of Scotland Community Housing Trust. This project is being keenly studied nationally and internationally, and Scott Mackay from the project will be the keynote speaker at the upcoming Town Centre Regeneration Conference in Murray. As the Minister will know, Town Centre redevelopment and retrofitting aligns well with our new national planning framework. Initiatives like this should be enabled across Scotland, and that needs to start with a pilot project fund for market towns similar to the Rural and Island Housing Fund. I welcome the Minister's keenness to understand the need in Scotland's rural and island places and his intention to make visits. But communities know what they need. They have a proven track record and tremendous network for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Community-led housing enables rural communities to thrive and is an investment in people and place. Let's support communities to get on with it and follow their lead. Let's deliver on the Butte House Agreement commitments, fund the enablers, invest in the setup of the hubs for materials and prioritize a dedicated workforce. Let's start rolling out community-led housing at the scale needed to reach our ambitious commitment to 2032. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. I now call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Graham Simpson. Around four minutes, please, Ms. Tweed. Presiding officer, given Brexit has already made it far more difficult for farmers and rural businesses to recruit people, I am sure all members will welcome the new Housing Minister's creation of a £25 million fund for affordable homes for key workers in rural areas. This comes on top of a commitment to deliver 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, with at least 10% in remote, rural and island areas. I also welcome the Minister's announcement of a delivery plan to address issues of transport, repopulation and economic development. In Balmaha, a rural village in my own constituency, a 20-unit project supported by the Communities Housing Trust and the Scottish Government cannot get on site because there are no contractors willing to work in this area. This is something that I hope the Minister will urgently consider in his delivery plan. Whilst welcoming these new providers, we should recognise the significant contribution that community-based housing associations and the cooperative movement have made to housing across Scotland. But I think this Parliament also needs to recognise that this movement is under severe threat from the Scottish Housing Regulator. The regulator was set up to protect the interests of tenants. It is completely independent of Scottish ministers. It reports to this Parliament only once a year. And unlike Oscar, its decisions cannot be appealed to an independent body. I worked for housing associations for 25 years, but I am not just talking from personal experience here. A former director of one housing association 
said our tenants did not need protection by the regulator, but they needed protection from it. The regulator has intervened in several community-led housing organisations in recent years. This has involved third-party investigations by consultants approved by the regulator and paid £1,000 per day, resulting in costs of literally hundreds of thousands of pounds of tenants' money. And it has resulted in several community-based housing associations merging with larger organisations. A recent proposal to merge Reed Vale, one of Glasgow's most successful community-owned housing associations, prompted the director of one representative body to claim that the regulator has an unwritten merger culture, which reflects an indifference to community ownership. Yet, at the same time, the regulator presided over the failure of Scotland's second largest landlord, which owned 12,000 properties, Dumfries and Galloway Housing Partnership, or DGHP for short. Following serious government failings, DGHP concluded it could not continue as an independent organisation and joined the Wheatley Group. But it's far worse than this. In January 2020, Scottish Housing News reported heavy-handed interventions by the regulator staff with one common theme of bullying. It said the style of work employed by the regulator is aggressive, over the top and frightening. A constituent, a constituent recently contacted me and presented me with credible and supported evidence of the regulator's bullying. This approach had result, resulted in staff feeling suicidal and unable to work. Yet when I asked the regulator's chair to independently investigate these very serious allegations, he refused, saying that the regulator's board had been assured by their staff that all was in order. He also failed to release information to me that I requested as a member of parliament. Members will be aware of the tragic case in England where a head teacher took her own life following an Ofsted inspection of her school and I am worried that without an urgent independent investigation into the regulator's practices that something here like this could happen in a Scottish housing association. It's great that rural housing organisations mentioned in Ar Ariane Burgess' motion can flourish and innovate and long, they, long may that continue out with the regulator's scope of activities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tweed. I now call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Mark Griffin. I remind members that speeches of around four minutes. Mr. Simpson. Uh, well, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by congratulating Ariane Burgess for securing this debate? Uh, but before I get into the, the, the meat of the subject that she's raised, um, I think what uh, Evelyn Tweed had to say should be taken extremely seriously um, and uh, I, I think it should be investigated by, by the Minister um, as a matter of urgency and, and taken forward in some, in some way. Um, but when we, uh, coming on to uh, community-led housing, which is the subject of the debate, uh, I know how passionately Ariane Burgess feels about this because we both sit on the cross-party group on housing um, and we had a session um, recently in fact it was our last meeting uh, when we um, looked at community-led housing uh, we discussed some of the projects that Ariane Burgess has already mentioned uh, the one in Gareluck whether 25 affordable homes are being built uh, the one on Staffing as well um, I think it's fair to say that community-led housing uh, is a success story where, where it exists in Scotland uh, and for good reason. It provides an additional supply of homes, it helps the local economy uh, and, and local industry, it encourages investment into communities and it helps younger people um, realise their housing ambitions. Now at that meeting uh, that I mentioned um, we uh, heard from Elsa Rayburn uh, who's the chair of Community Land Scotland, Ronnie Mackay, 
from Communities Housing Trust and Mike Staples of uh, South of Scotland Community Housing. And, and following the meeting, um, we wrote to the then Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robeson. Um, I sent a letter as convener um, last month. Um, and we had the following asks. So the first one was that the, the government should publish the remote rural and the islands action plan. Um, second was that they should consider forming a government action group. And the third was to commit to funding the activities of intermediary organisations. Uh, there are two more. The fourth was review grant conditions for community-led housing. And the final one was to make available funds for urban community-led housing, mentioned, of course, by Ariane Burgess, because it's not just rural housing uh, that we're talking about. So um, fast forward and we get uh, a dedicated housing minister and uh, to his credit uh, he has uh, responded very swiftly uh, to, to the uh, CPG, um, sent a letter um, dated the 12th of April, I'm happy to share it with uh, any member who wishes to see it, um, covers most, most of the uh, most of the things that we contain in our letter. Um, in some respects, it's, uh, it's quite vague, um, not, not unusual for a minister, but he has, he has responded. Uh, he has also offered to meet with myself, and I think that should uh, also include Ariane Burgess when we have that meeting. Uh, and I hope that he will attend a, a meeting of the cross-party group on housing where we can uh, discuss this subject because um, I recognise that he feels strongly as well. I think this is an, an example of where Parliament can work together uh, and it shows the value of cross-party groups. If we remove party politics from it, we can achieve good things. So um, I thank the Minister for his encouraging response and his approach to this and once again thank Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Mr Simpson. And I call Mark Griffin to be followed by Liam McCarthy. Mr. Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I, before I begin, refer members to my register of interest as the owner of a private rented property in the North Lanarkshire Council area. Um, today's debate, particularly on the rural and island housing crisis and the role of community led housing, uh, is very welcome. And I congratulate my colleague from the local government um, housing and planning committee for securing um, the debate in time today. Um, though I am an MSP for Central Scotland, there are actually very, very many rural villages in my region which, if you speak to those who live there, will tell you that they feel very distant from um, Edinburgh, Glasgow or, or any other city uh, in Scotland. What they will tell you uh, as well is that they know best what suits um, their own area. They know, what, they know best what does and doesn't work. And it's a, a sentiment that would be reflected in all of Scotland's communities. But it, it is a vital reminder for us that a one-size-all-fits um, policy or, or decision rarely work for all of, of Scotland. Uh, and even worse, sometimes they can have that um, negative impact. If they lose the buy-in of communities, that the impact uh, and not the, the desired way. I think we can all um, agree that more can and should be done to facilitate community-led housing and remove barriers to locally-based projects, um, projects which rely on local knowledge and the local input about what people's uh, needs are and what they think are the solutions for their own towns and villages. In November last year, I visited the, the Western Isles to hear and learn about the severe housing crisis there and the impact on the cost of living crisis that, that they were facing. And when I visited the islands, they were at the, the start of a devastating winter that would leave 80% of residents in fuel poverty. They felt badly let down by the UK government's energy support scheme because their heat and oil and solid fuel had not been capped. And residents, the council, local organisations, though, said as well that they did feel let down by the Scottish government too. Um, the, the TIG, the organisation tasked with delivering the area-based scheme for the council, cited a lack of rural proofing, 
within the PAS 2035-2030 retrofit standards as the reason for the closure of its insulation department with the loss of 14 jobs and the loss of that service. Um, the Hebridean Housing Partnership told me about how their maintenance regime, when it comes to maintenance, maintaining their, their stock, which is absolutely crucial when you consider that stock bears the, the brunt of the Atlantic weather. They talked about how a potential social sector rent freeze might impact on their ability to, to do that good work. And I also heard um, about the, the huge variation in the costs of building housing in the Western Isles. Tens and tens of thousands of pounds more to build in Barra than it would in Lewis, when most decision makers um, in Edinburgh would consider the Western Isles um, one homogenous area, when in fact th there are real, real differences there. And th though we debated Sc Scotland's national housing emergency yesterday for, for rural and island communities, as Ariane Burgess's motion points out, that emergency is compounded by the diverse and significant challenges facing rural and island communities, um, with some of the implications um, that has for sustaining their rural populations. But from, um, from ferries, fuel poverty, the increased cost of just about everything and the ability to access healthcare, education, poor digital connectivity, all interact with that housing crisis and are what make island and rural life extremely challenging. Um, local people tell you that they know best what does and doesn't work for them, so I think we should uh, just trust them, trust them to tackle um, their own local housing emergency. They, they know best and we should give them the tools to do that. Here, here. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Mr MacArthur. Thank you very much. Um, since being elected um, to represent Orkney back in 2007, I think the challenges around housing uh, have rarely been uh, off the, the, the radar, but I can't recall a time where uh, demand for housing has been so out of kilter with supply, where the, the need for new investment, but also new thinking and new approaches has been so obvious and indeed urgent. So I very much thank Ariane Burgess for allowing Parliament this brief opportunity to debate at least some of the issues, the concerns and the potential uh, solutions in this uh, area. The motion, of course, uh, focuses specifically on community-led housing, um, and that's entirely reasonable, though it's worth acknowledging uh, this is only one element of a wider debate, albeit an important one. And let me uh, welcome the specific uh, rural target now set within the government's overall commitment uh, to building 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. And that's helpful. However, we are off the pace in, in meeting either the um, or both the overall um, and the rural specific target, underlining, I think, uh, the urgency uh, for the Minister coming forward with the remote rural and island housing plan originally promised for spring this year. Indeed, it would be helpful if the, the Minister could spell out what role he expects community-led housing uh, to play within that plan, including co-housing, which isn't mentioned at all in the uh, uh, government's vision housing to 2040. Uh, whatever is in the plan, though, it will need to go hand in hand with a commitment to adequate funding. Without question, funding gaps remain the single biggest issue highlighted by all these stakeholders I've spoken to in Orkney, including all those involved in community-led housing initiatives. And the source of those costs are many and various. Acquiring land and planning permission can be costly and time-consuming. This is obviously, uh, often the uh, obstacle at which community-led housing uh, projects fall. Projects are often competing for land with private developers who have access, easier access to funds. Material costs are high and getting higher. Uh, and in the pre-construction phase, getting surveyors reports, building warrants, legal advice can run into the six fi figures, even for quite modest development. Uh, there's often a relative shortage of contractors and indeed uh, professional support in rural and island uh, communities, uh, particularly uh, where uh, there's a lot of building going on, and that's certainly the case in my Orkney constituency. And looking further ahead, um, the introduction of um, very welcome uh, higher standards in relation to passive house will inevitably, I think, increase costs further. And these uh, high and increasing costs uh, aren't being matched at the moment in terms of increasing commitments to, to funding and the value of the funding currently available 
is being inflated away. So uh, I think the, the, the government does need to address this particular issue. And as Mark Griffin said, there'll be variability within uh, island groups and within rural areas uh, themselves. Um, in the time uh, remaining to me, can I um, particularly welcome the reference in Ariane Burgess's motion to the co-housing project in Orkney. Um, as I say, it wasn't recognised uh, in the Housing to 2040 strategy. I hope that will now be addressed. As it's, it's an initiative that builds a community of homes uh, with shared functions and amenities, bringing together groups of private individuals who are, as you say, looking out for rather than looking after uh, each other. It provides collective living uh, and is mutually uh, supportive. And it does have particular uh, benefits uh, for older members of the population. Um, it addresses issues uh, of uh, social isolation and, and loneliness through joint activities and interactions. And in turn, actually, it keeps individuals engaged within the wider community, strengthening those communities as well. Um, I, I think the, the HOPE co-housing model is slightly different um, in that it uh, is a rental model rather than the, the leaseholding model, which has been more traditionally pursued. But it offers older people the uh, opportunity to, uh, between independent living and care homes and formal retirement housing, I think reducing care costs uh, and maintaining that sense of independence uh, and agency. But there are challenges. Uh, there's no obvious source of funding for the pre-construction phase. In the case of Hope Co-Housing, uh, that amounted to over £150,000. So I think the government does need to look at that particular aspect. Look also at um, uh, making it easier for community-led housing uh, projects to acquire land and to be facilitated through the planning project, uh, process. But housing, community-led housing in particular, is crucial to sustaining and building resilience in our rural and island com communities. I very much hope that the government will embrace that, take on board some of the ideas that have been uh, referred to in this debate, and they will certainly get my support in those endeavours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. And I now call Paul Sweeney, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond. Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the Member for Highlands and Isles, Ms Burgess, for tabling this motion for Members' Business today. Community-controlled housing associations are vitally important to the prosperity of communities across Scotland. And in recent years, we have seen more and more of them swallowed up by larger locally unaccountable housing associations, many with head offices out with Scotland. And I think that is a great shame because the whole purpose of social housing in Scotland is to ensure that there is a social element to the basic commodity of housing and that there is a rich history of success in the community-controlled housing sector. It isn't, or at least it shouldn't, be a method for wealth extraction or the stripping of assets currently owned and managed in the community. It shouldn't be a corporate game of boardroom monopoly with no get-out-of-jail free card for tenants when the big boys fail to deliver. And it shouldn't be a lever by which to control finance, remove democratic power and exert unwelcome external influence. If we go back to the original pioneering days of the Glasgow Corporation slum clearances and the first community housing association set up to save those tenement districts in Glasgow, it was done on the basis that those taking control of the assets, management committees of committed volunteers elected by local people who were rooted in their communities and knew what was best for the local people who lived and worked there. That was the very genesis of community-controlled housing associations. And sadly, I fear we are swiftly departing from that stated aim. Now, let me just put on the record that not all large housing associations are bad. In some instances, they are actually very good. And there is undoubtedly a role for them to play in the sector. But what we are now seeing is community-controlled housing associations that are financially robust, solvent and providing great services to their tenants being taken over at board level and railroaded into mergers with promises of a land of milk and honey. And there is no better example than this than Reedvale Housing Association in East End of Glasgow, as the member for Stirling pointed out earlier. It was set up in 1975 by one of the first community-run housing associations in the UK. They acquired a swathe of tenement properties in Deniston and prevented the evisceration of that community. And since then, they have refurbished their 900 properties and brought their community back to life through the introduction of traffic calming measures in a very densely populated part of Glasgow. Indeed, it's one of the most attractive communities to live in the city today. They are financially robust, they are solvent, and they are able to easily provide the services that their tenants and the wider community require. Yet they have been earmarked for what is being dubbed a transfer, but in reality it is a takeover. The Housing Association looking to acquire Reedvale's assets and stock have named themselves Places for People Scotland, but in reality they are a massive English-based parent company called Places for People who operate in Scotland as Castle Rock Edinburgh Housing Association, some of our Edinburgh colleagues may be aware of. 
They may also be aware that the parent appoints Castle Rock Edinburgh's Housing Association's board and can remove members at will, as well as placing their own staff on the board. Currently at Reedvale, the board is elected annually at its AGM by the tenants and other service users and are free and able to stand for election. This is a democratic right that we ripped away and if places for, if places for people and Castle Rock Edinburgh get their way. To entice current Reedvale residents that they are, they are offering a five-year rent freeze guarantee despite the housing regulator's website showing that the rents elsewhere in the country of this housing association are up to 26% higher than the Scottish average. And let's have a quick look at their performance compared to Reed Vale's. The average rent charged by Reed Vale for a three-bed flat is £69 per week. Places for people charge £98 per week. Reed Vale has a current overall satisfaction rate of 95%. PFP has a satisfaction rate of 81%. 89% of Reedvale's stock meets SHQS standards. Quite shockingly, only 73% of PFP stock meets those standards. Reedvale's average response time for emergency repairs is three hours. PFP take 14 hours on average, over four times slower. And for non-emergency repairs, Reedvale take on average one day. PFP takes 17 days, yes, 17 times slower. The whole, quest, the whole thing stinks, presiding officer, and it begs the question why. Why would a housing association predominantly based in England with an outpost in Edinburgh want to acquire a Glasgow-based housing association? I think the answer is quite straightforward. Profit. They know it will be incredibly profitable in the long term due to the area in which Reedville sits, and they know it will be incredibly profitable because Reedville itself is a profitable organisation with zero, yes, zero debt. And just before I finish, presiding officer, I'm conscious of time. The Minister and the Government are more generally will be wondering why this is a political issue and not something that can just be left to the regulator to sort out. Well, the reality is that unless we introduce legislation in this place that compels the Scottish Housing Regulator to provide ongoing and practical support to community-controlled housing associations to ensure that they are not swallowed by poorly performing beer moths, this charade will continue unabated. Organisations that have a proven track record of bringing about real regeneration, real prosperity, real inclusivity to neighbourhoods and communities are being lost. And if we are all going to stand here wondering why it's happening, whilst allowing it to happen, then we are all complicit. The modus operandi of these big unaccountable housing associations is to build new solar schemes. We don't need that, especially not in Glasgow. We need strong, locally run, community controlled housing associations rooted in our local areas, determined to grow and develop with quality and inclusivity at the forefront of their minds, along with providing a real influencing role for tenants and volunteers. Let's be clear, like every other sector in this country, the big players and corporates don't do this out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it because it makes them very rich. They can dress it up all they like with promises that they won't keep, but I can assure them that we and the local community will fight them every single step of the way and ask colleagues across all parties to seek to agree the need for legislative and regulatory change urgently to preserve and further develop a community-controlled housing model that continues to serve Scotland's people well and deliver the real and measurable outcomes for its communities that we sorely need. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. I now call on the Minister to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, first of all, can I refer members to my register of interest? I, I welcome. This is the third housing related to debate within a week, and I think I'd said yesterday to Mr Griffin and others I'd welcome as many housing debates as possible just to discuss the issues that we've, that's been raised today. First of all, can I'd like to thank Ariane Burgess for bringing forward this debate to highlight the important role that community led housing plays in rural and island communities, as well as the vital role that organisations play in supporting areas to bring forward their own housing projects to meet the needs of people in their own localities. Housing of the right type in the right place can have a powerful and generational impact, as we all know, supporting people to access the housing they need, enabling young people to stay in the communities in which they grew up, and supporting local businesses to retain and attract employees. Community-led housing plays an important role in our broad approach to deliver more affordable homes in our remote, rural and, of course, island communities. And also, taking the point you made myself, Mr Sweeney, it's not just in our remote and rural and island communities, it's all across Scotland and in our urban communities as well. And pick up that issue with you later on if, that, if that's okay. The Scottish Government wants everyone to have a, a warm, energy efficient home that meets their needs. That's why housing is a key part of independent missions published this week. Now, we're clear in Equalities, Opportunity and Community to document that affordable housing is a key part of our mission to prioritise our public services. The document sets out two important plans for rural areas. Now, that's the first one is obviously the publishes a rural delivery plan, and that focuses on how all parts of the Scottish Government are delivering for rural Scotland, including our policies in areas such as agriculture, land reform, repopulation, economic development, transport, and of course, housing. We'll also publish a rural and islands housing action plan that will set out our approach to rural housing delivery, including support for community housing projects. Now, when that's published, 
I want to meet up as with many uh, engagement uh, with many stakeholders as I possibly can. That's open to anybody in the chamber here. Please invite me to come along and speak to organisations you think would be useful in that context. The plan will include up to £25 million from our affordable homes budget to allow properties, including empty houses, to be purchased or long leased and turned into homes for rural and key workers and others who need affordable housing in rural areas. This is in addition. Yeah, of course. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, and, and thank the Minister for taking the intervention. While I very much welcome the uh, funding that he's uh, referred to, as I understand it, uh, that's targeted through councils and uh, RSLs, which is, is to some extent understandable, but it does exclude uh, development trusts who can play a, a pivotal role in the delivery of housing in, in rural and island communities. And I wonder whether he might uh, look to reflect on whether the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the routing through development trusts might be added to, to, to that funding pot. Minister. Yeah, thank you. Can I thank the member for the intervention? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and, and come back to you. Uh, if that's okay. Uh, now, this is addition, as I said, in the £30 million programme for, through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme. Now, that fund plays an important role in offering community organisations and others not able to access traditional affordable house funding a way to deliver affordable homes in remote rural and island areas while complementing delivery through our mainstream programme by councils and host housing associations. And, of course, the point that you made there. Uh, Mr MacArthur and about development trusts. And that programme has been a success. Between 2016 and 17 and 2021 and 22, we supported delivery of 8,000 affordable homes in rural and island uh, areas. And we're, of course, now working towards our target of 110,000 homes by 2032, which, of course, 70 per cent will be available for social rent and 10,000 will be in the remote rural and island communities. Now, that's backed up by £3.5 billion of funding in this parliamentary term. Alongside that new delivery, it's important that we ensure local areas have the tools to make the use of their existing housing stock. And I'll come on to that and some of the contributions just in a little minute or so. Over the past de decade, the growth of online platforms has, heard, has fueled the trend for residential homes, particularly in tourist hotspots, to be changed from primary homes to short-term lets or second homes. Now, of course, that can cause problems for local residents and make it harder for local people, particularly young people or those, those with fewer resources to find homes to live in. We also remain concerned about the number of empty homes in Scotland, which could potentially be brought back into use for people to live in. There's a review going on in that at the moment, which will be published later on this year. On the 17th of April, we announced a joint public consultation with COSLA on giving local authorities the power to increase council tax on second homes and empty homes, as well as considering whether the current non-domestic thresholds for self-catering accommodation remain appropriate. This is the first joint consultation with uh, COSLA, recognising that local authorities have an essential role in considering the right balance in their local areas, taking into account local needs. Now, I know that every community is different, and, that's, and while some communities have experience of delivering housing solutions to meet their own specific housing needs, there are those who don't. Uh, Ariane Bird just mentioned about the South of Scotland Community Housing and, own, and Community Housing Trust, amongst uh, other, other, other organisations. And of course, these have been and continue to be vital in supporting these communities to realise their housing ambitions. Opportunity, equality and community are vital to, ev uh, to everyone, no matter where they live. Delivering affordable housing in rural and island areas presents additional challenges, however. We cannot lose sight uh, uh, is that the delivery of more homes in these communities is absolutely vital with solutions developed collaboratively by partners including community groups, rural housing enablers and local authorities, amongst others, to drive projects forward to delivery. We mentioned around about community-led uh, local development, and I think that's key in supporting thriving and resilient rural communities. Um, the community-led local development network of local action groups works across Scotland's rural and island communities. Uh, and that's did deliver, uh, important to deliver grassroots projects, obviously with local determination, which can address a number of rural development projects. I want to touch on a few of the contributions, presenting officer, if, that, if that's okay. Ariane Burgess mentioned around about construction and employment. That would be something I would be keen to, to discuss with her. I think that's important, not just in rural communities, but looking across our delivery programme and that as well. And I totally agree. Community-led um, uh, housing uh, is an economic uh, enabler in the wider community. It can drive on communities. Mr Griffin mentioned about his visit, I think, to the Western Isles. I also visited uh, South East a number of months ago with the uh, Social Security Committee. Uh, and housing, I think, would, in that way would drive forward uh, economic prosperity, and that's vitally important. The point made by Evelyn Tweed um, and regarding the regulator, of course, the regulator operates independently. Uh, of that, but direct, the report directly to the, to the Scottish Parliament, and I'm happy to take up any issues that were raised by her and also uh, Paul Sweeney uh, in that regard. Graham Sandrin mentioned around about the meeting with the cross party group. I'd be delighted to meet up with him in the group and hopefully come along to the next meeting if we can get a date in the diary for me. I'm more than happy uh, to, to do that in that regard. Mark Griffin obviously talked about his visit, and I think that's. Yeah, of course. Evelyn Tweed. 
Minister, thanks for taking an intervention. And I hear what you're saying. Um, you're going to look into the concerns that both myself and Mr Sweeney raised. Yes, I completely understand that the Scottish Housing Regulator is independent of government. However, if it is operating in a way that is not good for community-led housing associations across Scotland, is it not for the government to look at that? Minister. Can I thank the, the, the member for that, that contribution? I think it's obviously, as I said, it, it's, it's reporting to the, to the Parliament itself. I will take advice from officials in that regard about how we can address. I'm happy to meet with yourself and Mr Sweeney to discuss these issues and meet with officials to discuss the issues that you've raised. Uh, yeah, of course. Paul Sweeney, yeah. briefly, please. I thank the Minister for giving me that point. The Glasgow and West Scotland Housing Association Forum have been very strident in their concerns about the behaviour of the regulator, not just that, but also the culture of consultancy that's crept in around it. It's a very insidious and potentially corrupt practice that needs to be urgently investigated, and I urge the Minister to look into it. Minister. Yeah, that commitment, I, I will take that, take that on. As I'm happy to meet with yourself and, and Ms Tweed as well in, in that regard. So I think the point that you made, Mr Sweeney, as well, in terms of the, the community-controlled housing associations is key. It's not just for our community-led organisations, but throughout Scotland, and I think you've, you've obviously mentioned that in, in your speech in regarding how important it is in, in some of the areas in Glasgow. Um, Mr MacArthur obviously mentioned about community-led housing in the target, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, the co-housing model, again, I think that's something I think that would be worth considering as well. I um, worked with a, a number of extra care housing groups and set up an extra care housing task force who had a parliamentary event here and also had a stall here. And again, I think that model is, uh, is keen to try and look to how we explore uh, in terms of rural housing uh, as well uh, in that regard. So I think uh, I'd like to thank members for, for their contributions um, in regarding this. And as I said, I'm, I'm delighted this is the third housing uh, debate we've had in, in, in a week. I'm aware of the time, so I'm just going to conclude. I want to close again by uh, thanking Ariane Burgess for bringing this debate forward and to all those who've taken part and alongside me recognise the crucial role that community-led housing plays in our vital rural and island communities. And as I said, the offer is out there again. Happy to, to visit any suggested groups that you think would be worthwhile to go visit. I'm grateful for the work that has been and continues to be undertaken by communities and rural housing developers to deliver more affordable homes in our rural and island communities. They deserve that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m. Thank you.